Thank you for joining the Once Changing the World, which is India's first Future Tech Meets Sustainability podcast. And today, I'm delighted and honored to have with me Dr. Sumit Kumar, who's the CEO of Innotera Nanosystems, a pioneering Dutch neuromorphic processor company. He holds a Master of Science and PhD in Microelectronics from the Delft University of Technology and was previously with Intel where he worked with the Imaging and Camera Technologies Group developing domain-specific tools for the development of complex media processor architectures. Dr. Sumit is also a project manager at 2 Delft, where he manages the research program building next-generation compute hardware for highly automated vehicles. So, Dr. Sumit, really appreciate you taking time and being part of a humble podcast. For context, we always start with an intro and background. Very, very nice to, to, to join you on this uh, this program, uh, Eddie. I, I originally come um, from India. I came to the Netherlands about um, 15 years ago, and I came here to do. Uh, I came here to study, um, and um, after I finished, of course, I went to uh, work with Intel, and then um, I set up a number of uh, R&D programs in the European Union, essentially targeting building um, uh, compute platforms that can go into um, intelligent automated vehicles of the future. Um, around that time, we also had a research program running at Delft, uh, which essentially sought to recreate brain function um, in the form of electronic platforms. And the purpose back then was to really provide neuroscientists with uh, a reliable and robust platform on which they could do their uh, experiments in a repeatable manner. And as that project went along and as we actually started speaking with industry um, out here in Europe, uh, we also realized that there was a very strong connection between the problem many device vendors were facing when they came to integrate sensors inside power constrained devices and the capabilities that neuromorphic computing, brain inspired processing really has to offer in these sort of applications. And that's really what led us to starting Inatera back in 2018. Um, and since then, we've essentially been growing the company um, ever since. And our mission um, eventually is to bring intelligence to a billion sensors by 2030. I want to get into neuromorphic computing and understand what it is. But before we get into that, it would be nice if you could talk about some of your works with uh, the Delft uh, building uh, vehicle automation. So at, at Delft, we've, we've had long running programs which essentially sought um, to realize high performance computing for um, applications in automotive and also in the consumer electronics sector, for instance, devices like your mobile phone. Um, and in order to actually put that much uh, compute going into these devices, you really have to build chips and chip architectures, which are extremely power efficient. Um, and our focus at Delft uh, throughout, I think, the last decade has been on building uh, microprocessors, multi-core processors, which could bring high performance in an extremely uh, small power budget. So back around 2010 or 2011, we were targeting you know, bringing a two tera ops per watt kind of processor uh, into your phone. Subsequently, the, the, the focus shifted a lot towards automotive. And the reason for that is that there was this increasing drive to make vehicles safer and the way you make vehicles safer is by bringing in functionalities that aid the driver where humans don't perform uh, really well in driving. And those functions all happen to be around perception. So, you know, the I think the emergence now of things like blind spot detection, uh, emergency braking inside vehicles, all of this uh, utilized technologies which have been developed in the last seven to eight years. Um, and what this points to is that the vehicle integrates many sensors and the sensor content in vehicles is going up. Um, and as the sensors essentially grow and get deployed around the vehicle, they tend to generate a lot of really complex data, which is increasingly being used for very critical driving functions in the vehicle. For instance, emergency braking. Someone runs in front of your car, you need to be able to, the sensor needs to be able to detect that there is a person. It has to do that reliably and it has to do that extremely quickly. And this requires that you place intelligence close to the sensor itself. Um, and this is really what the focus um, was of these R&D projects that we carried out in, in Europe. These were large projects that we set up with Delft and um, participants from 14 to 15 different countries. It included semiconductor companies like uh, NXP, Bosch, and Infineon. 
Um, we had uh, automotive uh, OEMs as part of this project, companies like um, BMW, Mercedes-Benz, as well as tier one suppliers across the value chain, essentially companies that build uh, you know, the sensor modules and the ECUs that actually go into these vehicles. We brought all of these partners together. The entire value chain was there. And essentially, we looked at how, if we had to deploy the future intelligence platforms into vehicles, how exactly would that happen with all of these players um, in that value chain um, uh, for future vehicles? So that's really what we did at Delft. And in parallel with that, our work was really a lot about um, taking uh, accurate neuron models, which come from biology, which really replicate how your brain works, and implement them in an electronic platform with really high fidelity, you know, with such high fidelity that um, both the biological neuron as well as the electronic version of the neuron essentially produce the same sort of a response. Um, and when you have that sort of a system, a neuroscientist is really able to carry out experiments on the platform, stimulate the neuron, and get the same response that they would get from an actual biological neuron. This was really the basis of the work that we did at Delft. Would you like to expand a little bit on that? What is the future of mobility going to look like? Because you said the major problems with uh, 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 automating a vehicle is, is perception. Uh, is this the approach would uh, creating a biologically inspired uh, chip, would that be an answer to creating a level five automation? Because I, I think Elon Musk and so many others, I mean, overestimated on, on you know, having a level five autonomous vehicle. But it, it in true sense, at this point in time, we, it seems like that we, we pretty much far away from, not pretty much far away, but there's some great innovation, but it seems that we are, are far away from uh, you know level five autonomous vehicles. What what are your views on that? Some somebody who's been talking to all the stakeholders, understanding the problem points, looking at uh, creating a model which is biologically uh, emulating the brain. Uh, what would be the right approach to get to a level five or autonomous vehicle? Around the world, when you talk to different vendors, um, you know different OEMs building cars you start to see that a lot of them are somewhere around level two and level three today in terms of their automation. And this basically means that for a majority, more than 95% of the time, you essentially have a driver driving the vehicle and they are aided by safety features inside the vehicle like blind spot monitors and uh, emergency braking in the front and you know, adaptive cruise control to a certain extent. Um, and then you have newer generation vehicles like the, the level threes, uh, which have a, a certain amount of additional driver assistance where the vehicle will keep itself in the same lane on the highway. And increasingly, there, there are people talking about features where you have an adaptive cruise control where the vehicle is also able to change lanes as you go down the highway. But these features are not powerful enough. The, the, the vehicles are not power, powerful enough yet to actually operate independently. A level five vehicle ideally would not have a steering wheel inside. And this vehicle would be able to operate in any situation, any road condition, whether there are markings on the road or not, whether it's urban or it's rural, whether it's raining or it's snowing or it's perfectly dry conditions, whether the roads have signs or not, whether other people respect traffic rules or not. These are all the kind of situations a level five vehicle needs to be able to deal with. Now, Dealing with that, actually making a vehicle intelligent enough to do that requires two things. The first is the ability to perceive the environment very robustly. And the second is based on that perception to be able to decide how to act um, and, and, and how to predict what to do next and, and how really to take decisions. And the first part of the story can be addressed really with, with chips uh, like the ones which we are currently bringing to the market that essentially allow you to process sensor data very quickly, very efficiently, very robustly, extract insights and then pass it on to the, you know, the system which sits further from you. And that's the one that makes uh, all the decisions. Today, we focus on making sensors intelligent so cars can become safer, so drivers have the information that they need in order to make that decision. But 
where I think in terms of the industry, we don't yet have the necessary compute power or even the computing methods to make it happen is to really pack a product grade intelligence into a vehicle that would allow it to operate autonomously in this level five sort of condition. And I'll tell you specifically why that is. We have a lot of very unusual behaviors that we, um, that, that, that we as human drivers kind of express when we're driving. Um, for instance, when there were, you know, when there were these, um, uh, when a lot of vendors replaced their rear view camera, uh, rear view mirrors with cameras looking at the back, we immediately realized that there was a problem there because it turns out that when you're driving on the highway and you have a car on the right side of you and you don't know what that car is going to do, intuitively what you actually do is try to find the face of the driver in the rear view mirror. You try to see whether the driver is actually looking at you because the driver is looking at you, then there is possibly an intent that the driver wants to change lanes. But the moment you eliminate the mirror, you can't see that anymore. So there's no way for you to actually gauge the intent of the other driver. This is often a conflict which will likely arise when you have a mixed uh, uh, traffic situation where you have some vehicles that are fully automated and some which are still driven by um, you know by human drivers, I think when everything is automated, you can you you can address these sort of things with you know vehicle to vehicle networks that kind of communicate intent with each other. But you know, long story short, essentially what I'm trying to say here is that the level five problem is actually a very complex thing to introduce. It requires um, fundamental evolution in the kind of semiconductors which we have available to us and that we put into vehicles. That's number one. We need uh, maturing of the neural network and general AI models that can be utilized for perception, decision-making and control applications to the level where we feel that these are safe to be deployed. And the third is that we need an ecosystem to really be in place that vehicles are able to actually interact with each other, do these kind of things with each other. There are plenty of prototypes in the world that do this. The challenge there is to take those prototypes and now put them into uh, production. So we are on our way. It's going to take some time, but uh, we definitely see all the pieces moving in the right direction. Right. Thank. Thank you for explaining so wonderfully that you know there it's not a single problem. It's a multi problem. And, and yes, I think it, it it's going to be addressed in its own due course of time. And the things, the way the technology is accelerating at, at times, uh, uh, it, it's. It's overwhelming that you know you have these image to image to text to image text to video even you know text to possibly music so so there, there's some really cool things happening it's overwhelming at one point of time at the other side it's it's also scary where artificial intelligence is going and all this I think this new computing architecture the neuromorphic computing that we talk about. Possibly, mm -hmm. it, it, it's gonna accelerate that. So I, I, I you know, we the, the the conversation is about neuromorphic computing, and though we, we jumped a little bit ahead, I, I think it'll be nice if, if you kind of like, you know, first of all, maybe explain to my audience what is, is neuromorphic uh, computing. You, you you mentioned that it, it's it's brain inspired, but I would love it if you could kind of uh, elaborate on, on that. And once we and what could be those applications of a neuromorphic. Uh, uh, Chip. Today, when we really look at um, this this entire notion that you see of edge computing, uh, the, the best way to think of it is with this picture um, that, that you see on the screen. Uh, this picture essentially shows you how data goes from a sensor into the cloud where much of the world's you know heavy lift machine learning and that, that sort of processing is done today. So on the extreme left, you have a sensor which is producing data continuously. And this data is being streamed through a multitude of processors, a multitude of uh, processing steps before it ends up at the data center. Where you do the heavy lift machine learning and you get the you know, insights from large volumes of data. And then that, you know, those insights travel back uh, towards an edge device. So if you think of it from the context of a smartwatch, you have a sensor inside the watch. The sensor talks to a small microcontroller, which sits right next to it. Um, the data coming out of the 
you know, microcontroller is sent over a Bluetooth link onto your mobile phone, which is where the multiprocessor system on chip sits. Uh, that thing uh, does a certain amount of AI machine learning on, um, on you know, the, the, that, that sort of inference on the data stream. And uh, a majority of that data is, again, sent into the cloud over your wireless link or, or, or a mobile radio link. Um, and then you have maybe an Amazon or a Google server sitting somewhere doing the actual voice um, search for you. Now, each of the processors that is involved in this step actually has a very specific task. And if we start at the data center, we see that the processors in the data center do some pretty complex stuff. They uh, apply uh, very large neural network models, billions of parameters. Um, these are very general machines that can run all kinds of models, whether that's image recognition or you know, voice recognition, speech recognition. But as you come closer to the sensor, you see that the function that's actually running on the processor becomes more specific. So as you come closest to the sensor, you see that on the processors, you're typically doing things like conditioning sensor data. You're trying to understand its relevance. Is Am I interested in this data or not? You're trying to adjust the sensor. But very importantly, you're actually classifying the data and you're trying to identify patterns within the data. What's most notable is that as you move close to the sensor, the amount of power that's available for the processor to do its work becomes smaller and smaller. While at the data center, you don't really have a power constraint. As you come close to the sensor, you do have a power constraint. Very often it's less than a milliwatt or just a few milliwatts. And the reason here is that most edge devices tend to run on a really small battery. And of course, because battery capacity is limited, you can't consume too much power. And remember many of the applications that we now see, if you think of voice recognition, if you talk to your Apple device, you say Siri or a Google device, you're saying hey Google. All of these use cases rely on always on sensing where the sensor is always measuring something. It's continuously generating data. And if you had a processor that burnt a lot of power, you would drain your battery almost instantaneously. So what we do as Inatera is really try to integrate intelligence close to the sensor so that we can extract patterns, we can detect patterns of relevance, we can identify events of relevance um, at the sensor itself and not have to go all the way to the cloud to basically get that sort of insight. And we can, by doing that, you essentially end up with sensors that output directly actionable information. So the sensor tells you, I'm, I'm hearing this word, or I'm seeing this person directly without needing further processing. Now, what we do again, the, the way we do this is with what we call the spiking neural processor. This is a neuromorphic processor that enables turnkey intelligence, turnkey pattern recognition in applications where power is limited. It essentially allows you to analyze sensor data in real time to detect patterns of interest, to identify them, and to possibly change or condition the data that's coming out of the sensor. Uh, we typically target applications which tend to have an always on nature, that is the sensors producing data continuously and this data needs to be processed very fast. And usually in the applications that we target, um, you need the detection to happen very quickly. So you either have a, you know, just a few milliseconds. At the most, you probably have a few hundred milliseconds to carry out the detection. But most critically, you have a very small amount of power, very often less than a milliwatt or just a few milliwatts. And that's really where neuromorphic computing comes in. Um, the way we do this with the spiking neural uh, processor is by using a brain-inspired neural network which is called a spiking neural network. And the best way to think of it is that this is really a neural network which has an inherent notion of time. And let me explain what that means. So the screen on the screen in front of you, you essentially see uh, a multi-stage pipeline showing you how a spiking neural network really processes data. So on the extreme left, you have your sensor data, which comes in from the sensor. And the first step that we do to that sensor data in order to treat it with the spiking neural network is convert the information in that input data into a spike-based representation. So a spike is essentially, um, it's a binary value. It's a one or a zero. But the critical information about the input is encoded into precisely when this spike occurs in time. So if, if, I, if, to, if I have to give you a very naive and very basic example, if your input is really strong, the spike happens soon. If the input is really weak, 
the spike happens late. So in a, in, in a sense, we encode the content of the input data into the uh, exact timing of these spikes. And now what we have is a spike-based representation of the signal, which is coming from the sensor. And this spike-based representation is what is given to our trained spiking neural network. So this is effectively a network of neurons and their connections, which are synapses. And these synapses have been trained such that the network implements a certain function. And this function can be um, feature extraction, where we're trying to extract the important features from the input signal, or it can be classification, where we are actually identifying what are the features that we're seeing in the input, or it can be signal conditioning or transformation, where we're changing the characteristics of the signal that has come in from the sensor. And that's really what is done inside the spiking neural network. And the way it does this is by leveraging and modifying the timing relationships between different spikes. So if there are two spikes which are very closely related to each other, the network tries to bring them closer to each other. If there are two spikes which are far apart, which are not correlated, the network tries to move them further apart so that they completely have no effect inside the system. This is fundamentally how your brain also works. It manipulates the timing relationships between different spikes and then naturally allows you to do things like pattern classification, feature extraction, and signal processing. Now, what is very implicit in all of this is that this network has a notion of time. It has a notion of when a spike is early and when a spike is late. It understands this time difference. And you don't have to artificially create time inside the network by using a clock signal and maintaining a timestamp. The network naturally has this notion of time. And that is very powerful because most sensor data tends to be temporal. So you have time series patterns which come in from sensors. And in order to process them with conventional neural networks today, we very often have to create very complex topologies that allow the neural network to remember what its previous state was. So in order to do temporal processing, you have to break time into steps. And at every step, you carry out some processing and you take some actions to remember what you did before. In a spiking neural network, you don't really have to do this artificially. It's it's a you know fundamental feature of the network itself. It remembers what it did before. And this is really what allows us to do very powerful things, even with very small networks of spiking neurons and, and synapses. In fact, the spiking models on, on in, in several applications are up to a hundred times smaller than the equivalent convolutional neural networks, deep neural networks, the traditional artificial neural networks that you find in the industry, you're able to shrink them down. And this advantage really comes from using this approach to neuromorphic computing, really mimicking how the brain processes information. And now there's a second, second complete aspect to that, is that this, I'm, I was so far talking about the algorithm, how the algorithm processes information. But then the next question is, how do you implement that algorithm in silicon? Because if you try to do this sort of a thing on a conventional processor, conventional processors tend to be digital and they tend to run on a clock, which has discrete time steps. So how do you do continuous time processing with a discrete time processor? The short answer is that you don't because it's not very efficient. Uh, a better way of doing it is by actually computing in the analog domain. So analog domain compute essentially means that you compute with continuous time, currents, and voltages. Exactly how the brain does it. The brain doesn't use currents and voltages exactly in that way. It uses ionic concentration changes, sodium, calcium, potassium, varying the concentration. It essentially creates these, um, you know, equivalently what we represent as currents and voltages, the brain does with uh, different ionic concentrations of, of, of these elements. Um, and essentially what we build inside the spiking neural processor is a fabric of programmable neurons and synapses that are implemented using analog mixed signal uh, circuits. And this allows you to implement a spiking neural network in this continuous time fashion, much like the brain does it, without introducing any of the limitations that we have in conventional digital processors today. Um, and this combination then of a brain-inspired algorithm and hardware which closely operates just like the brain does, essentially gives you a processing solution 
that consumes about 500 times lower energy than a competing AI accelerator or a digital signal processor to process sensor data. And it's able to do that about 100 times faster than these competing solutions. So, tell me, this chip that you, you guys have built, Inotera has built, what are the applications that it, it's powering today? And what are the challenges, challenging applications you think of tomorrow that Inotera, uh, these neuromorphic chips will be able to power? This is a very powerful space to be in. Uh, as of today, we focus a lot on applications which are in the consumer and industrial spaces, primarily because these applications are ramping up um, at our customers. You increasingly use devices that utilize voice recognition functions. You buy security cameras that um, run on batteries that, that, that you know, very intelligently detect if a package has been kept in front of your door and send you an alert. All of these functionalities essentially rely on a certain amount of intelligence backed into your device. And this is ideally, the, this is actually the first place that you will see these sort of neuromorphic technologies also coming out into the market. Devices like your smartwatch, your phone, these security cameras, a smart TV. These are likely the first elements that you will touch that have a neuromorphic basis. Um, to them. Going forward, though, that, you know, at least for us, we see that this space will widen quite a bit, because increasingly, we are seeing not only in the consumer and industrial spaces, but even, um, you know, generally, when you talk about IoT devices, all of these are battery powered devices, there are new use cases, which are constantly popping up, for instance, there is a new regulation in, in Europe, where you need to have a carbon dioxide uh, sensor inside inside of your house. And all of these basically show you that sensors are, you know, really coming into the environment around you. Your ambience is becoming more sensor driven. And if we are to change the way how you interact with the digital world, we have to make that interface very seamless. The digital world has to kind of blend into your, um, into your life uh, without you really knowing it. You should be able to um, work with electronic devices without having to explicitly communicate your intent and what you need to do. Um, all of this requires sensors to come into the world around you. And wherever you have a sensor, of course, you need a processor. You need the processor to bring in intelligence. And that is fundamentally where neuromorphic would come first. I also have to say that neuromorphic will also appear in other parts of the chain that you cannot see and that you probably will not know that it's there. And one of those spaces will be in the data center where larger models, larger neuromorphic models to do more complex things like, you know, search and translation um, will run at the back end in the cloud. Um, and you'll likely not be exposed to it. You'll never see it. You never know that it's neuromorphic. But the only thing that you'll make out is that services become cheaper, services become more robust and faster, and you're able to rely on these services a lot more on a daily basis. Yes, you mentioned about, you know, how neuromorphic chips will be powering the future. You mentioned about IoT. Uh, and mm -hmm. I think uh, in the next few years, uh, everything is going to be digitized. You know, I mean, everything is going to be sensorized. You know, we, we, there's going to be digital twins everywhere. Then we're talking about the metaverse, which which is in, in, in such a, a huge hype such a fantastic and a scary space you know because i guess i for almost all the podcasts you know uh, episodes you know i keep on saying that you know the arthur c clark's quote uh, is now coming true you know that you know any advancements of technology is going to be indistinguishable from magic you know and i guess we we're getting into into that zone and i think there's more need for us to as researchers as entrepreneurs as you know uh, government nations we need to come together because these these tech stack is is like you said is going to give us earth shattering ap applications i'm curious to know what you meant by that would lo lo love it if you elaborate a little bit on that a and what are your views on artificial general intelligence do you think neuromorphic computing chips could be powering uh, artificial general intelligence um again to, let's let's take that in two parts the, the the first part is 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 really about these, these earth shattering applications um the, the, I think the, the, the fortune of the generation that we, we, we tend to be living in right now in, in terms of technology is that we've become very accustomed to 
you know, using electronic devices on, on, a, on a daily basis with, with features that we rely on without even thinking about the fact that we're doing it. Like, I'm always amazed, amazed by the fact that, you know, I plug in my phone and it has the, uh, the, the quick charge option where I have 50% of my battery in just 15 minutes. And I can remember an age when that was not the case. Growing up in India, I had a dial-up connection back in the in the 90s, and I remember paying, you know, an, an incredible amount of money just to get 100 MB of 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 of, uh, of, of download, basically, for, for for that entire contract. And now, of course, the world is very different, even even what we started this conversation with. So, what what we have kind of lost is this consciousness of the kind of features that we're using on a daily basis. And if there is an earth shattering feature that really comes into your device, it's very likely that you will not even realize that it's there. Um, if we look at the 3D face unlock in the, in the, in the latest set of, of iPhones, um, this is an excellent feature. Face unlock in general is an excellent feature, but what, 3D, what the 3D angle there with the time of flight sensor does is that it makes it so much more robust. But if you really think about the complexity of that use case, the kind of sensor involved, the kind of processing involved, that is a pretty significant amount of processing that we are now doing in a narrow power envelope. Um, and you know we've, we've come a very long way in, in that sense of deploying sensing into, into this sort of a use case. Um, what, what I mean by earth shattering is that I really hope that we are able to leverage neuromorphic and AI technologies in the future to be able to do good in addition to all the convenience that we bring into electronic devices. And by doing good, I mean, we're able to make the world safer. For instance, with, with vehicles and infrastructure in general, we're able to uh, make people healthier, really by monitoring how um, people's health is, people's uh, condition changes over time, basically raising a warning flag before someone starts to become sick. I think that there is a very strong role for AI and machine learning in general to play there. And we see that increasingly with things like ECG monitoring in the, the, the Apple Watch, for instance, and increasingly what the Fitbits and the activity trackers do with things like heart rate monitoring and, 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 and uh, oxygen saturation monitoring. All of this really points to the fact that AI is going to become embedded in these devices and power efficient AI is neuromorphic. And that's fundamentally where we'll see a lot more applications coming in that impact how we live our life and you know give us a lot more peace of mind the second part about general intelligence i think that this is a you know um, we don't fully understand really what what this entails um, at the moment you know i think we have to be very humble about the fact that we build neural networks and we build ai solutions if i can call them that to do very specific things and we usually get them to do good but we don't always uh, get them to generalize well enough and to, to, to function outside you know, what we've really trained them to do. This is changing. You know, neuromorphic brings in the ability to do more unsupervised learning and learning at the edge. But we're, in my personal opinion, I think that we're still quite far from this notion of generalized, you know, really general intelligence from that perspective. With, with 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 neuromorphic and and with with general intelligence uh, we will see a number of different computing platforms coming together as we go forward um, we'll see different styles of neural networks and styles of machine learning kind of blending with one another you don't have to do everything in a single system practically speaking it will be a you know a patchwork of different computing elements different neural network styles different programs in general um, all of them directed towards doing something. So, uh, within the field, you know, looking at uh, where we are, I don't think that we are at a point that we really have to be scared what the capabilities of such a machine uh, could be. I think the uh, the thing to be scared about is what one could do with such a, you know, with such deployments and how you could use that responsibly. That's a completely different discussion. There is a very strong opportunity really on the table. These technologies allow you to do some very, very powerful things, um, which there are loads of opportunities on the table to actually do a lot of good with them. Uh, so I 
I would prefer really to focus a lot on those opportunities rather than you know. <laughs> right uh, I, i think the next few years is going to be transformative for uh, the entire world and also for india you rightfully mentioned i mean we have a growing appetite for tech and, and there are some great things happening and I, i see that there's a convergence of tech i mean you know i mean there is uh, since i've been invested in metaverse and that's that's the area which i've been kind of like trying to nudge forward uh, i i see that you know everything is going to be converging you know you 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 your physical world is, is going to be sensorized uh, we we going to be creating virtual worlds uh, and the virtual worlds are going to be powered by 5g artificial intelligence uh, these sensors which will be powering iot and and, and you, you also mentioned the power efficient ai you know having intelligent on, on these objects is is going to be such a huge game changer you know so so what comes next for you what's the future road map for inatera for inatera the so we 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 are currently in the process of taking our first uh, product to the market and we built several chips that really show uh, really how efficient neuromorphic uh, computing can be and that too in the context of real world applications that you know you will see in a few years you know possibly in a in a mobile device that you buy or you know uh, one of these iot devices that you pick up um but that is really a starting point uh, fundamentally the way we see it to an industrial customer uh, to, to any customer building a device it matters less that the chip inside is neuromorphic or it's analog or it, this doesn't matter so much what matters is that you're able to do the job well and we think that in order to do the job well we have to be neuromorphic and we have to have a, a certain technology um angle that allows us to have these benefits but for the industry it's some benefits that really matter um and what we will aim to do for the next few years is to really understand in more application verticals than we currently target what these requirements would be what is the next set of applications where this sort of a brain inspired highly efficient ai platform can add value and additionally these next generation of applications will they require a different sort of feature set to really unlock the true potential let, let me tell you what that means in um in a, in a simple example like you know the, the the robot that you use in your house to to vacuum the floor um the device is able to learn the layout of your house really well it figures out you know where the furniture is it figures out what the for the floor plan of your house is and now it can even figure out you know which which rooms which areas tend to get dirty more than others all of this essentially means that as the device is being used it's actually learning from the environment that it's in now, how does one do this very efficiently this will be something critical the thing more critical is how do you prevent your device from forgetting what it was trained to do when it when it came out of the factory um these are very very fundamental challenges that i think the more we see applications in the market that kind of need these features the more we'll understand what the hardware needs to do to actually deliver these features so really the next few years for us has two parallel tracks the first is once we get the product out into the market it's really to understand what are the other applications where this chip can actually add value how do we build those applications how do we enable that value that's one and then the second track is to understand for the next generation of applications what are the new features that really need to be built how how should we build them how should we bring more of these brain inspired concepts which really make our brains so fascinating in how we're able to process information and how we're able to take these decisions that that we take how to somehow take those features and put them in the form of you know future silicon generations that can continue to add value in the next set of applications that come up in the horizon these are the biggest challenges for us but the common theme in all of that is that we have our ears to the ground and what we're most interested in doing is really speaking with customers and speaking with actual builders of these applications to understand how we can add value to their systems and that's really the the the, the, the main thing that we're focused on doing 
Uh, Sumit, thank you for taking time and being part of the podcast. Uh, we're sitting in an exciting point of time and we, we, we're kind of figuring out things. We just, I think, at the, in, in such a nascent stage of understanding things, you know, the, I say, say that is because I think the most complex organ uh, or, or the machinery in this world is, is the human brain and you know, it's 86 billion neurons 100 trillion synapses the way they fire and wire it brings about mm -hmm. the entire human consciousness of us understanding not just ourselves but the entire you know the universe you know everything we see yep. perceive create uh, 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 is an output of this machine and we are so close to so close so far i don't really know but we 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 have are on the journey of emulating the brain uh, you know and i think that this journey is so wonderful because i can just i mean i can't even fathom you know what would it look like what the world would look like when we are able to build a neuromorphic chip that emulates the entire human brain or the 86 billion and 100, 100 trillion synapses the way they fire and wires it, it, it's going to be magic uh, i'm sure it, it's going to happen because at, at one point in time we, I, I think we, we would use the term impossible but i think that the way mm -hmm. the 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 technology is converging you know with neuroscientists computer scientists and all all, all of these uh, different uh, you know folks with different uh, expertise coming together mm -hmm. I, i'm sure that we'll come to a point in time where we'll we'll be able to emulate the en entire brain and once we do that it's going to be awesome you, you guys are doing something really awesome w wish you the very best more power to in I, I think you want to say some i you want to close with some last words i actually wanted to show you something and i, I don't know if you'll actually be able to see it um on uh, on, on on the camera and this is really um one of our second th this is a silicon from our second generation wow. it's uh barely barely visible um, this this tiny chip has about you know 100 and 128 or so spiking neurons on it, um, and doesn't really sound like a lot compared to that 86 billion number which you just said. Uh, but this chip can essentially do some pretty powerful stuff. It can process audio data, it can process radar data, and all of this essentially using this brain-inspired processing on this tiny piece of silicon. So just imagine where this 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 tiny bit of silicon can go. Very likely, it will be in a, in a in a device that you're holding in your hand in a few years from now, or a car that you're driving in a few, five years from now. Um, and the only way that you'll be able to know that it's there is that your vehicle is a lot safer. The phone is easy to use. That's how you know that it's there. Lovely. Congratulations on that. Thank you for showing it to us. And I hope that we can have another conversation like this, possibly 10 years in in the future, maybe at 2032. And maybe you'll be holding uh, uh, maybe something, maybe even smaller, possibly. But instead of 128 neurons, maybe it could be uh, maybe, I don't know, maybe a couple of million neurons or maybe more. You know, so we wish you the very best. Thank you. Really appreciate you taking time being part of the podcast. And to my listeners, if you like what you see in here, then please press the subscribe button. Until next time, see you guys. Thank you so much. Really appreciate this. Thanks a lot, Eddie.